Okay, awesome. Thank you everybody for attending. Um, we did have uh, quite a few people that uh, registered for the class. And if for those that cannot make it, this will be on our website and there will be a recording. So fear not that you're going to lose out. Um, I'd like to proudly introduce Dr. Loreen. She serves as the director of the Stanford Patient Education Research Center and as a professor of medicine in the Stanford School of Medicine. She first earned her bachelor's degree at Boston University and then went on to achieve her master's and her doctorate of public health at the University of California in Berkeley. Um, she came to Stanford and developed first a um, research and self-care for people with arthritis, which that program um, was so well received that it morphed also into um, the arthritis self-help course, as well as the chronic disease self-management program, um, working with patients with cancer, as well as um, as HIV and um, uh, then moved into the chronic pain self-management course. So uh, a wealth of experience around uh, patient-centered care and, uh, and self-care at home. So we are pleased to uh, welcome her today and please, this is a very small group. So if you have specific questions or we want to move into a little bit more interactive rather than a webinar format, we can, we can do that on the fly. So um, if you wanna um, chat, feel free. Everybody should be well aware of how to do a Zoom lately. Um, feel free to use the chat liberally. Um, we'll take breaks during the presentation where we can ask any questions or ask for clarifications, et cetera. And um, feel free to make this as interactive as you wish. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Loreen and take it away. Ah, thank you so much. I am so very, very pleased to be with you all today. And I would like to correct just one little thing. And that is that about three years ago now, we actually closed our center at Stanford, although I continue to work part-time at Stanford, but really on the projects of other people. And I and some of my staff started a small company called the Self-Management Resource Center. And that's why you'll keep seeing things about the Self-Management Resource Center and, and on our on the slides and on our website, et cetera. So same program, Stan we left very amiably. Stanford actually gave us all the programs we developed there. And um, so kind of same stuff, but in a little bit different venue. Thank all right, so that. what are we going to do today? Today, we're going to talk a little bit about the chronic pain self-management program, what it is. We're going to talk a little bit about the evidence. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how we're going to implement, how we go about implementing this. Now, I know that some of you on this uh, webinar are already implementing SMRC programs, and some of you don't know anything at all about them, and this is kind of all new stuff. So some of you will be bored and some of you may be a little overwhelmed, but we'll try to deal with everybody. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop after each of these small parts. What is it, what we know, and how can you implement it? And so that we'll have time for questions and you can put those in the chat or you can just wait until we stop and, and probably just ask them. So anything you want. All right, so let's go on to the next slide. Um, the basics of the chronic pain self-management program is to give people with chronic pain the skills and confidence to live the 99% of the time that they're outside of the healthcare system. Uh, because most people with chronic pain spend most of their time not in the healthcare system. And when we designed this program, we designed it focused around patients perceive needs and problems. And I want to stop right now. You don't have to answer this, but think in your own head, what do chronic pain patients want? And I will tell you, I was a little surprised by the answer. The way we got this is we literally did in-depth interviews with a bunch of pain patients and they pretty much all told us the same thing. So let's go and see the next slide. What they want is they want to get their lives back. That was the phrase that they used 
over and over and over again. They didn't tell us that they wanted less pain. They told us they wanted their lives back. And when we asked them what getting your life back meant, it meant being able to get out of the house, be, being able to socialize, being able to go to work, uh, being able to shop, being able to garden, being able to, to go to games. I mean, these were what they were talking about as they talked about getting their lives back. And so it's not a coincidence. Um, I will tell you all that we are updating the program right now. So there will be an updated program and an updated book by fall. It doesn't mean you can't start now. It's gonna be pretty easy to convert from one program to the other and they're gonna look pretty much the same, but there's going to be some differences at all. And one of those differences is that the, the, the uh, book that goes with the program is now, it's, it's called Chronic, uh, chronic Pain Self-Management or Living, Living a Healthy Life with Chronic Pain. And then the subtitle is Getting Your Life Back. And that's very purposeful. And that's something we talk about throughout the class now, because this is what patients focus on. And one of the hallmarks of our programs is we try to focus on what patients want. Now, of course, there is another side to that. And let's see the next slide, please. And that is, there's all the expertise that people have, uh, health professionals have with pain. And so we literally have and work with, uh, the OT we work with is on faculty at the University of Illinois in Chicago. The PT that we work with was the Dean of Physical Therapy at the University of Missouri. We work with a bunch of physicians that are pain experts, in, including the head of the pain center at Stanford, who also was head of the US Task Force on Pain, uh, a number of RNs, uh, for this current program, we really hunted very hard for an RD that works specifically with pain and found one at the University of Vermont. And um, so she's helped us. And then of course, psychologists. And for psychologists, we've been working with Frank Keefe at Duke, Duke and Beth Darnell at Stanford. So we basically take input from lots and lots and lots of different people. And we try to get that input from the very top people in the field. So we try to marry what patients want and what we know about self-management, what we know about pain management. And by self-management, we basically mean non-medication non management and non-device management. It's not that a lot of these people aren't on medications and devices. It's just that that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about all the stuff outside of medications and devices. All right, let's go on to the next one. So I'm gonna first talk about what the programs have classically looked like. They're two and a half hours a week for six weeks. They were small in-person groups, eight to 15, two peer leaders, and they were designed to be offered in community settings. And th this is probably my favorite picture it's Jorge's garage, it's in San Diego, California, it's in the barrio, and Jorge was holding a class in his garage. Now, most of our programs, quite frankly, are not held in people's garages. Uh, they're held in senior centers, they're held in libraries, they're held in parks and rec, they're held in hospitals, they're held in public health, uh, public health office buildings, but the course is designed so that it can be taught in Jorge's garage or in a grotty church basement somewhere. And each participant that comes to the class receives a book. They receive an exercise CD, which actually comes in the book. And, if, and I know that not everybody uses CDs this, these days. So that's also available as an MP3. So people have a choice of either getting an MP3 code or getting a CD. So that's what the course looked like until about a year ago. And then let's see the next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Let me talk about a little bit about what's taught first and then I'll tell you what happened a year ago. These are the major topics that we talk about. Action planning, getting people to do things, problem solving, decision-making. These are not things that are generally taught in pain self-management classes or in pain classes, but they're really the core of being able to live a full life 
because with pain as with any chronic condition, these change all the time. And unless you kind of know how to go from the peaks to the valleys to the peaks again, then anything you learn is not going to be very useful. We teach exercise, uh, dealing with difficult emotions, what we call worst case thinking. Worst case thinking is really pain catastrophizing. For those of you that are pain experts, it's a major problem. Pain catastrophizing is, oh, I have a little pain. Oh, it's going to get a lot worse. I can't do anything. I'm going to stay in bed today. That's pain catastrophizing in, in a short bit. Uh, so we do, but we call it worst case thinking because pain catastrophizing sounds pretty awful and it has too many syllables and it's just not friendly. So that's why worst case thinking. We teach a lot about pacing, uh, how to kind of move through your life uh, in such a way that you can have the minimum, you can minimize pain. Now, the way we do this is we don't tell people what to do. In the very first week, we have them keep pain diaries. In the first week, they look at their pain and their activities and see if there's any relationship. And the next week, they add to that their emotions. So they're doing pain, they're doing their pain, their emotions, and their activities, and seeing if there's any relationship. In the third week, we add, what are you eating? And seeing if there's any relationship. And so people actually, we actually take people each on their own discovery journey. And different people discover different things. And then we help them tailor a program to their needs. Or basically, they make all the decisions. We just kind of help guide them. We do a lot around communicating, communicating with ourselves, communicating with friends and family. With pain, it's really, really hard because you can't see pain. And the result of that is that friends and family tend to get pretty disgusted. We do a little bit about healthy eating, and we also do some specifically about eating for pain. And if you're wondering what eating for pain means, uh, we were on a long journey about this, but basically it means a Mediterranean diet. Um, it can get a little more complicated than that. And the evidence probably in our entire program, the evidence for nutrition and pain is probably the weakest, but there actually is some evidence. And so we tell people, kind of give them an idea of how to begin to experiment with this if they care to do that. We talk about sleep and fatigue, a lot about the mind-body connection. We help people learn how to describe pain to their health professionals because it hurts, does not help of a health professional very much. But rather, I have a stinging sensation in my shoulder every time I lift my arm above waist level is much more helpful. And then we do a lot around working with health professionals and what you can expect from health professionals uh, and how to use your time best in a health professional setting and also the difference between a health professional and a healthcare system. Because if they have trouble getting an appointment in most systems, that has nothing to do with a healthcare professional. It has to do with the system and they need to be able to separate those two things out. So these are the things that we generally teach in our programs. And as I said, they're taught over six weeks. And the next slide, please. So now we get to what happened with COVID. So it was just about this time last year that all the folks around the country started saying, help, help, what do we do now? And a few folks just kind of took off and said, we're in the middle of a class, we're going to finish using Zoom. And very quickly, we discovered that in fact, the workshops that had been in person could be done with Zoom or with any other platform. And so lots and lots of people around the country in the last several months have been doing workshops using Zoom and other platforms. And that was all fine and good until I started talking to the people in Cleveland. And the folks in Cleveland said to me, yeah, but our folks don't do Zoom. We don't have computer, they don't have computers, they don't read very well. What do we do now? And handing out 500 computers in Cleveland didn't seem like a really good idea or even feasible. And so we very quickly, based on their advice, developed an, another mode of offering programs 
And that is by mailing people materials and what they get in the toolkit um, is they get a book, either a CD or the MP3. They get a relaxation CD or an MP3. They get a self-test, which I'll talk to you about in a minute, and they get some tip sheets. Well, what the self-test does, which sits on the top of this box that they get, is it's just standard scales that many of you probably use. There's a depression test and a sleep and a stress and a fatigue and um, some pain things. And then they score them themselves. They take it, they score it, and then they can look up and see, oh, it looks to us like you're having trouble sleeping. You might want to look on these pages in the book. Or it looks to us like, uh, we, like you're having problems with your knees. You might want to look at these exercises in the book. And there's actually pictures specifically for knees. So these are the sorts of things that the, the test does is it helps them self-tailor their reading and their work. But we also know that these people are very isolated. And so in addition to the toolkit, they have telephone calls with a group leader, which are about an hour long each week. It's a group of three to five people and one leader. And there's a script for these telephone calls that takes them through the major parts of the workshop. So it's two parts, it's the materials plus weekly small group telephone calls. Now, I will tell you, I had great skepticism about whether these toolkits would work. It just kind of seemed a little strange to me, but people seem to want them, so let's try them. In the next session, I'm gonna actually show you some data, which um, the bottom, I'll tell you the bottom line is yes, they do work. So, there are now three ways that one can take the pain self-management program. They can take it online, they can take it in person, they can pay, take it on phone and toolkit. And my guess is long after the pandemic is over, all of these modes are going to continue. Uh, one of the surprises to us was that as many people took the toolkit as took the online version of the program between uh, April and November of last year when we actually tracked it. So these are the different modes. And I think there may be one more slide in this section, maybe not. Nope. So let me stop for a moment and see if there's any questions about what this actually is. What is the pain self-management program? Or if there's things you'd like to know about it. And feel free to raise your hand or um, put something and we can promote you to a panelist so that you can speak. Anything? Oh, we have one person, Maynette, that you can promote. It's Leah Fitch Brody. Okay, go ahead, Leah. Hi. Uh, I don't know. Can I, can you only hear me? I, you, yes, we can. Okay. Mm -hmm. excellent. <laughs> Hi, Kate. Um, this is Leah Fitchbrody and I'm, I'm one of the uh, chronic pain self-management uh, trainers here in Missoula. And um, we, we've been teaching this class and we did it, we did it online, uh, online with a group in the fall and plan on doing one again in June. And um, when we were asking people about whether or not they would want to do it online or not. Um, we were actually surprised that a lot of people did want to do it online. And so I'm happy to hear that, you know, going into the future that um, we would continue to be able to do it online. And, and that's really good to hear and that it's actually, uh, uh, you know, something that people want to do. So you, you said you had some data around, um, you know, the mail, the toolkit, the mailing toolkit. Um, but do you have data around the effectiveness of, of it, of doing it online as well? Not yet. Okay. Not yet, but, um, coming, I think. Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay. Anybody else have questions? If not, we'll go on and.
talk a little bit about the evidence that we have. Okay, this was the original trial. This is an old study. If you look at the bottom there, I think you'll see that it happened in, you know, maybe you can't see when it happened. 1998. 1998, it's an old study. So we're looking at a 20 year old study. That was the original program. Uh, it was done in Canada. It's actually done as a doctoral dissertation for, for Sandra Laforte, who then went on to a very illustrious career as the Dean of the School of Nursing in um, New, uh, Newfoundland. She'd kill me if I got the province wrong. Uh, and what she found in that trial was that the quality of the people's pain got better. Quality is, by the way, not something that we measure so much anymore. This was a measurement that has kind of came and went. Um, that the severity became better, that they were less disabled, they were less dependent on others, they had better role function. And role function is the stuff about getting on with life. It's just what we professionals call it. And finally, they had better self-efficacy or confidence that they could do things to manage their pain. So again, as I said, this was a randomized trial. It was 110 people. Uh, it was published in Pain, which is probably the premier journal uh, dealing with pain. But it's an old study. And there have been a few smaller studies since that time. But there hasn't been a large study, which has been really interesting. Nobody has kind of replicated this study. Until recently, there is a study that is happening in West Virginia right now. It should be almost over. It was funded by CDC. I have not seen the outcomes of it, and I've not seen the date. It's not been published yet. But there is a study that hopefully will be published very soon. And I'm not sure whether they have online data or not. My guess is they might. Except remember that group in Cleveland that said, we want to try telephone? Well, when I said, when they said that, I said, by any chance, could you collect some data? And they said, sure, we'll collect data. And now lots of people tell me they're going to collect data and I never quite believe it because what we end up with is usually not much. The folks in Cleveland, thanks to Fairhill Partners and Stephanie Fall Creek, actually collected some data. And I'm gonna show you that data now. I'll also tell you that these are very preliminary results. And when I say preliminary, I mean that we literally just crunched the numbers last week. But I'm pretty sure we crunched the numbers right. And um, so I'll be happy to show it to you. So let's go on to the next slide. The next one? Yes, please. So here's the intervention. No, no, let's go back. Just so that, let's go back. Yeah, the intervention was the mail toolkit, which I've talked to you about, and telephone calls, three to four people in each group, actually three to five. What was quite amazing to us is 80% of the people attended four or more sessions. We consider going to four out of six sessions as completers. And the reason we consider that as completers is because we know that people get the benefits of most of our interventions if they attend at least four sessions they get much less benefit or no benefit if they attend less than four sessions. So the idea of getting people to attend four sessions is really key. So why in the world do we give six sessions? Because if we only gave four sessions, then we'd have a whole bunch of people that only attended three or two and would get nothing. If you give six sessions, most of them attend four or more. Nationwide, our attendance for four or more sessions has run about 70%. So I was pretty amazed that in this telephone intervention, it ran 80%. Now you might say, well, these were very special people. And yes, they were very special people, but they probably aren't the people that you thought they're going to be. So let's go to the next slide. These people all came from inner city Cleveland. I showed you this picture because this is actually a picture of a class at Fairhill Partners before COVID, because I wanted you to get a picture of who we're talking about. They were mostly female, 
mostly older. A lot of them, almost 30% of them had less than a high school education. 59% of them told us they were disabled. Uh, about 80% of them actually had arthritis. A whole, and even more than that had hypertension. Nearly half of them were African-American and nearly 25% of them were dual eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. So this was exactly the population that we wanted to get to. And we were really pleased that yes, we could get to these folks. These are the folks that are really cut off by the digital divide. And these are the most underserved of the people in Cleveland. So let's go on to the next study, next slide. Here's some outcomes. Um, for those of you that like statistical significance, all of these were significant at the 0.01 level. This is just a pre and post test. So they did this before the workshop, they did this after the workshop. Their pain severity was reduced by about 13%, their depression by 22%, and their self-efficacy by 10%. We did not do much for their sleep or for their fatigue. So you're going to see more about this and hopefully you'll see it in publication before too terribly long because we're in the process of now trying to write it up. But all of this happened during the act during the pandemic. I mean, uh, you know, never let a never let a good pandemic go to waste. And um, thankfully, there were some folks out there that we all pulled together. Uh, this was a non funded study. Nobody, we just kind of did it. Bear Hill collected data, they sent it to us. Uh, we crunched the numbers. I have a young rheumatologist that's working with me that needs a publication. She's going to write it up. And so it's all going to work out somehow. But yes, all, all during the pandemic. So this, this at least to me says that if the phone, if the phone and toolkit work this well, I can't imagine the virtual um, would, not, it would not have very similar outcomes. There's just no reason why it wouldn't. <laughs> it's, it's a little longer, it's a little more interactive. And we know that the attendance is about the same. We already know that. But it's gonna take some more study to really be sure that that's true. There is a study that is just beginning that will look at one year outcomes for eight different programs. The three programs from SMRC that it will look at is it will look at pain self-management toolkit phone. It will look at diabetes self-management online. And it will look at chronic disease online. So we're not looking at, but if chronic disease and diabetes online give us similar outcomes to what we saw in person with those programs, there's no reason to think that pain wouldn't be the same. It's all the same study is also looking at a number of other programs, walk with ease, uh, enhanced fitness. Um, I'm not gonna be able to name them all for you. Unfortunately, I should be able to, but I can't. Anyway, there's gonna be a number of the programs that's being run out of the University of Washington. And what's interesting about this is we're using the same outcome instruments for all of these uh, programs. And I think we're gonna be able to not only see kind of different modes of delivery and how effective they are, but we're also gonna be able to look at comparisons about different types of outcomes. So, that's the preliminary data I have for you today. Do we have any questions here? Um, this is Amber. I just a quick question. Are I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, but are all of these, since they're all using the same, have they all shown that improvement in the reduced depression, reduced um, pain severity for you know the diabetes? You know, no, all of those. no, 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 all these programs have, and we wouldn't expect them to. I mean, I would expect that um, a depression program is going to show greater changes in depression than our pain program. And I would, I would, I would guess that um, 
enhanced fitness is going to show more increase in mobility than we're going to be able to show. Yeah. But it's going to be able to take a look at that. We may get some surprises along the way. Okay. Questions from the rest of the group? Feel free to chat them in or raise your hand. I'm not seeing any, so let's- Okay, well, let's go on to the next piece then. So I was asked to tell you all how, or at least discuss a little bit about how you get started. And this is probably the most complicated part of the program. And I will tell you at the very last slide is going to say, if you have a million questions, ask me with contact information, but I'll try to go through with you what it is that people need to do to get started. All right, let's, next slide. To begin any of, to begin the chronic pain self-management program, or for that matter, any of the programs offered by SMRC. The programs we offer, by the way, are chronic disease, pain, diabetes, um, cancer thriving and surviving, uh, positive self-management, which means living with HIV, and finally, building better caregivers, which is a program for caregivers. So to, to offer any of those programs, what you need first is a license. And I'm gonna talk about what each of these things are in a separate slide. You need somebody to manage the program. And depending on how big or how small the program is, it can be part-time, it can be full-time. In some cases, it's several people. You need trained leaders and you need a plan for recruiting participants. So those are, the, those are the key elements that you need to have before you start a program. Next, please. Now, you can start in many different ways. Each organization can have its own license. And a license is $500. And for $500, you can give 20 programs over three years. You manage your own training and your own programming. You're just totally independent. But more and more organizations you're doing is they're banding together to form, to have an umbrella license. An umbrella license may be held by a state. Many states hold umbrella licenses. They may be held by a large, um, hospital system like Dignity Health in California holds, and it's actually it's more than just California holds a, an umbrella license. Um, I think Sanford, I'm not sure if Sanford holds a umbrella license or not. I meant to look at that up in, in the Dakotas. Any rate, you, you can get have an umbrella license. With an umbrella license, you can name as many organizations as you want that will be covered by that license. But the license holder is basically the hub of that network and is responsible for managing the network. And I know you're going to ask me how much those cost. And I can tell you that all of our licenses are based on the number of workshops you're going to give over three years. So at the time that you come to us and say, we want a license, the first thing you're going to be asked is how many workshops you're going to give over the next three years. And then based on that, we can tell you what the cost of a license. Umbrella license generally start at $5,000. And we do have one other license in between that offers a little bit more than 20 courses. I can't quite remember what it offers. I think it offers 60, that's $1,500, but it's a single organization license. But basically you start by either getting your own license or joining with somebody that already has an umbrella license or forming your own umbrella organization. And an umbrella organization is not limited by state. Uh, you, you can decide who's in and who's out of an umbrella license. That's not for us to do. If you want, we're happy to point you to people in your geographic area that are already doing the program that you might be able to team up with because it's, it's kind of the fast way of getting started. All right, so now, now we've kind of talked about getting licenses. Let's go to the next slide. This is what a slide, what, this is what a license gives you. It gives you the right to do any of our programs 
in any language. All of our programs are in English and Spanish, uh, with a couple of exceptions. And some of our programs are in as many as 10, 12, 15 other languages. So if you want a language, we very well might have it. It gives you the access to all the leader manuals for all these programs in all languages. Um, it gives you a place on, the, on our listserv. And that may sound like, oh, well, who cares about that? Our listserv ends up being very, very valuable because what it means is that you can ask a question and probably get an answer really fast. Uh, somebody called me the other day and said they wanted to make a video to show to their doctors. Now, I know that that has not worked terribly well. But I said, why don't you ask the list of how they got their doctors to refer? Because I know what they're going to get is they're going to get some other ideas that are a lot cheaper than doing a video. And maybe somebody's going to tell them making a video is a great idea, in which case I could be wrong. But people can ask questions, they can share learnings. Uh, I want to work in the pr a prison system. Has anybody ever worked in the prison system? Yeah, we've been working in the prison system in Illinois and Oklahoma for years. That's the sort of thing that happens on the listserv. And then you also get some technical assistance from, from us. People ask us questions all the time. And generally, if it's not you know, too terribly difficult, we'll, we'll answer and be helpful. So that's what you get for your license. All right, let's go to the next slide. What does your program manager do? The program manager helps recruit leaders and sees that they are trained. And they decide where workshops should be held and in which modes. Uh, they coordinate participant recruitment. They maintain fidelity because our programs really need to be given the same way in Missoula as they're given in New York City, as they're given in Denver, as they're given in Chicago, as they're given in London, as they're given in Hong Kong. And they're responsible for reporting to SMRC and whatever other agencies are funding them. So that's what a program manager does. SMRC does not have very a lot of reporting uh, requirements. We just want to know how many courses you've given each year, how many people you've served. So it's pretty easy. All right, next slide. Trained leaders. Leaders for most of our programs are peers. They are not health professionals because health professionals are not going to go to Jorge's garage on a Saturday morning, which is when that class was held. And the more the leaders can look like the people they're serving, the better off it is. In Wyoming, you know, have people in the oil industry. Uh, in Phoenix, you may want to have some people from the Native American Health Center, or from the Hispanic community. Uh, in East Palo Alto, near where I live, our leaders are Samoan. So you want people from the community. They generally receive, they, sometimes they're volunteers, it depends on the organization. Training leaders is expensive. You want them to stick around. They do a lot of work. And so most organizations pay them about $200 every time they do a workshop, which is about minimum wage. Um, they can, and the other, the other advantage of peers is you want peers that have pain. Because it's really hard to say to somebody, oh, you just don't know what it's like. But in fact, you two have been living with pain and you've told the class that. Um, yes, they can be staff, but if they're staff, they should be people with chronic conditions or with chronic pain conditions, uh, not just somebody that knows a lot about headaches. Uh, it's best if they're not health professionals. Having said that, we do have some health professionals that teach. <laughs> but they have to take off their health professional hat when they teach. Um, training for leaders can be done either in person or online. If it's done in person, it's four days. If it's done online, it's done over seven weeks, two, two and a half hour sessions a week. Um, and training can be done by your organization 
Um, you can have master trainers uh, and you can do that by contracting for master trainers. And we can always find your master trainers that are willing to train for you, especially if it's online. Or SMRC has now been doing leader training for the last few months. And if you want, we can train some leaders for you too. And you can find information about training and our training on our website. Let's go to the next slide. So how do you recruit participants? The bottom line in recruiting participants is you need to keep it easy for the end user. That's really, really important. Uh, somebody called me the other day, they had this great recruiting scheme. They were going to have the doctors refer to a central agency who was then going to bet what the best program was for the person and then was going to send the name to the organization that did the program and then that organization was going to contact the person when they had a program. I can tell you that that is almost for sure not going to work. It's just too many steps and between the time the doctor sends something, if the doctor ever sends something, <laughs> to the time it gets back to the organization giving the workshop, by that time the person may, you know, is going to long have lost interest. You really, really want to make it easy. So you can do that if you have an email list of patients, uh, of an email list from a senior center, an email list from the local Grange, an email list from the Rodeo Association, an email list, I don't care from what it's from. Email lists are good coming from organizations that people like and are members of. So that's one way is just sending out an email and saying, we have this great program. If you're interested, click here. And it takes them directly to the program. And then either somebody can call them or they can register right then. If it's a healthcare system that has patient portals, sending a message to patients from docs is really easy for the doc or for the system. And patients respond to what they usually get in their patient portals. We tried this at Stanford and we got about a third of the people that we sent things through the patient portals actually signed up for classes. Uh, call centers. Uh, there are some places in this country that use call centers. Um, I can go into more detail about that if you'd like. Local media. I know that a lot of you live in rural and semi-rural areas. Your local newspapers, your local radio stations, your local TV stations are still really good ways of recruiting in rural areas. But so are church bulletins, Elks clubs, um, lions clubs, I always call them our animal friends. Uh, and I happen to be an elk, uh, which has a funny background to it, which I can tell someday over drinks. But um, we sometimes forget these groups, but they're really important. And then you can also use direct mailers or you can put something in the bags. One of the ways Cleveland did, got all their folks is these people are coming to pick up bags of food at food banks and they just put flyers in the bags of, at the food banks. So you have to know your local area and how people use the local area. If I'm in Stonington, Maine, I'm going to use the Island Advantage and the two town bulletin boards. But that's the stuff that you have to know. All right, so let's see. Um, you're supposed to be seeing a screenshot of our homepage here, but I sent the wrong set of slides, so you're not seeing it. So let's go on to the next slide, and which is also the last slide, and then I'd be happy to answer lots of questions. Um, <coughs> if you can just remember Self-Management Resource Center, if that's all you remember, Google it, you'll find our website, and then you will find all this information there again. Or just remember to find me, it's kate at selfmanagementresource.com. And I will point you in the right direction. If you're interested in training, it's training at selfmanagementresource.com. If you're interested in licensing, uh, this is getting boring, I know. So anyway, hopefully we're pretty easy to find. And I think I'm going to stop there and we still have a few minutes. So I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. Feel free to put something in chat. 
Um, I'd be curious for, I do, I do know that Leah has her self-management program. She spoke earlier, but if any others of you on the line have a program, I'd love for you to just put in your name and, and your location if, if, a, if you're able. Um, Leah, do you want to volunteer um, how many classes you've done and, and where you've had those classes? You're on mute if you're still there. I am, I'm still here, sorry. <laughs> It was it was uh, hard for it to press the button. Um, yeah, so we have done um, around five uh, classes and um, normally, so we've done them in Missoula um, and um, we've done them at the Senior Center a couple of times. Um, we've also done them at Silvercrest. Um, most recently we did um, one online, but specifically with um, Grizzly Peak, which is a retirement community uh, here in Missoula. And th uh, that was really helpful. We were able to work with the activity director there and um, she was able to have some of the residents, uh, they could socially distance and have masks on. And then um, that way we could, you know, have people be online, even if they like, you know, weren't comfortable getting online themselves, like um, they were all able to be on like a conference call kind of thing. So that was neat. Um, but this next time we're gonna be doing it, um, uh, the, the, the standard kind of online um, uh, format. Um, and that's gonna be, you know, just for, for anybody um, who is interested or anybody who has somebody in their life with um, chronic pain as well. Perfect. One of the advantages on about online is that you you end up getting people that you would have never gotten before. You Absolutely. Get, you get folks that are severely disabled. You get folks that are in rural areas that would never travel to your in-person classes. So there, there's some real advantages to that. I would say that as a facilitator though, um, doing it online is not as rewarding. Um, <laughs> because I think, you know, Kate, that that ability of being able to relate and talk to each other and create those relationships yeah. is so powerful. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you from around the country, we're getting mixed reviews. We get some yeah. people that say, this is the best class I've ever given. And there's people <laughs> like you that say, this is not quite as rewarding. Yeah. And I think both are probably true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> if you've seen one class, you've seen one class. <laughs> So um, yeah, I'm not I'm not discounting that, but I'm just saying the re the reviews the participants seem to like it a lot. Yeah, we're getting, we're getting nice letters from participants. Excellent. Yes. Um, and I would be interested. Um, Mountain Pacific would be very willing to uh, support anybody in their journey if you're just now thinking about starting a program in your particular area. Um, we do have various community coalitions across our four state area. Um, I'd love to be able to assist you and put you in touch with resources if there's something that Mountain Pacific can do to facilitate that. Um, so feel free to reach out and let us know what you need. Um, and sometimes we have um, different folks that we could ping to, you know, perhaps that could be trainers or volunteers um, in, in our co community coalition. So happy to help where we can. Yeah. Any other questions from anybody? If not, while you, while you have a last chance to think about questions, I am going to do an advertisement. And my advertisement is that in another part of my life, I am a co-investigator for a program for rural caregivers with dementia. And we are recruiting rural caregivers who are caring for people with dementia. They can be any place in the United States. The program is totally online. We don't need you to do anything except help us recruit. Um, the questionnaires are all online. Now, these people have to be able to deal with online and they have to be able to read. That's a requirement. The program is called Building Better Caregivers. It's asynchronous, which means that people can log on whenever they want. Uh, we ask them to log on two or three times a week for six weeks. 
And the neat thing about this program is they get to talk to each other and they talk to each other through threaded bulletin boards along with getting lots of content. And uh, this, is a pro this is a study that's being done by the University of California, San Francisco. If any of you can help us recruit rural caregivers, and I know that's not why you came today, um, I put out this plea any place I go because rural caregivers are not easy to find. Right. right. So just write me and I will get you in touch with the folks at UC San Francisco. And Kate, I'd be very willing to um, also share that with that recruitment, what email or whatever you have. Okay, fine. Have materials. Yeah. Um, I'll send it to my colleagues um, within Mountain Pacific to share with their groups. So Terrific. Mm -hmm. All right. Other folks, this is your last chance for questions. Okay. I have a question, but I want other people to be able to talk if they want. <laughs> I think you can go ahead, Leah. Okay. <laughs> um, so Kate, I, I know that I get this question a lot. And I think because a lot of people um, in our country right now um, are um, addressing the opioid crisis, which you know has been um, exacerbated by COVID. Um, and I think, you know, um, you know, I'm a substance use disorder prevention person. And so, you know, I know I think I've asked you, I've talked to you about this before and 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 asked around um any um data you might have around um reduction in opioid misuse um and i know you were doing a specific i can't remember if you were doing a specific workshop where you were gathering data on that or not yeah okay um yes i mean the, the work that i'm doing at stanford right now is with a pcori research project on opioid tapering for opioid users mm -hmm. And one of the interventions we're using is the pain self-management program. And so, I, and so I can tell you that the program is being used as an adjunct to opioid tapering. And right now, I know a lot of people around the country are being um, tapered or they've actually been being stopped. And th there's a huge amount of angst in the opioid community because of this. And we're now talking about prescription opioids. Um, but I, we don't have the data yet from the Stanford study, so I can't show you any data. But I know that various other groups around the country are using the program as an adjunct to opioid tapering uh, mm -hmm. and for addiction programs. Mm -hmm. So that's the best I can tell you. Within the program, we talk a little bit about opioids, and mostly what we talk about is safe storage. Mm -hmm. Because the largest place for opioid diversion is from the home. Mm -hmm. And so the whole issue of what you do with opioids in the home, strangely, when we when we've surveyed people, I, I, I'd almost survey you if, if we had had a poll, I would have done this. I should have done this as a poll today and I didn't. If I did, my guess is that 50 to 60% of you right now have opioids in your home. And I'm not talking about street opioids. I'm talking about the codeine the dentist gave you. Yeah. And because that's what we find around the country pretty much is 60 to 70% of people have opioids in their home. Yeah, and just to tag along with that, along with the harm reduction kinds of strategies of safe storage, um, you know, Leah and I work together quite a bit on um, trying to increase the, um, the dispensing of naloxone as well. And yeah. anybody that has opioids in their home should also have naloxone in our opinion. So um, a plug for that as a, another okay. harm reduction yeah. strategy. Okay, so... Um, we'll know more about this program and opioid reduction probably 18 months from now. This is, a, this is a long study. We'd love to hear about it when it's done. So, um, uh, is Utah one of your areas? No, yeah. um, but there are different people that from other states that are available to join. But Okay, I was going to say, because one of our study sites is Intermountain in Utah. Okay. What are the states on this call? I'm curious. Uh, we have um, Alaska, Hawaii, 
Montana, Wyoming, and then we have our folks from Guam. Oh, terrific, terrific. And we have programs in all of those places, including Guam. <laughs> great, great. All and right. my uh, take home message is make the referral easy and target your population. Yeah, target the population and you know, if you can get to if you can get to the person that you're trying to get to. The other the other thing that I would say is give them a choice of modes. Mm -hmm. So, would you rather take this in person? Would you rather take this online? Would you rather take this online, or would you rather do it by telephone? Yep, because different people have very different choices. Yes, indeed. Okay, guys, thank you so much for attending. Um, feel free to shoot me any questions. The recording will be available. It will be on our website. It will also be on Dr. Loring's website as well. So I will send that recording to her when that's done. And uh, you all have a great afternoon. And I would love to hear from you all. So long. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for presenting. Okay. Bye-bye.